Welcome to the Digital Amateur Television Experimenters Night. This is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania. Amateur radio is a worldwide hobby that has many different aspects. Digital television is just one of the many modes and areas that are covered. Maybe you're interested in becoming involved in the DATV Experimenters Nights. Do you realise that you do not have to be a radio amateur or need any ATV equipment to participate anywhere in the world? Also participate in the night by coming up to the Queen's Domain Club Rooms. Yes, right on top of the Queen's Domain in the Heritage listed Coast Wireless Station. You never know, we might get you in front of the camera or behind doing one of the many roles during the night. We get underway with our program on a Wednesday night from 7.30pm local time. We'll see you soon. This is VK7 OTC. Okay, this is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania with our DATV Experimenters Night. And I've got Rex, regular contributor in the studio, um, and there's some exciting stuff that he's going to be telling us about. Um, so just before we get underway, uh, I wish to acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, uh, the traditional owners of, of the land upon which we uh, meet, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the knowledge and the culture and hopes of Aboriginal Tasmania. Welcome Rex. Hello Justin. How are you going? Pretty good. Now I saw on the interwebs lots of lots of brilliant pictures of Auroras. Yes. In the not too distant past. The last couple of days, that's right. So, what was the event? What was the. Okay, well, let's go to the first slide. <laughs> oh, now, see? <laughs> he's, um, he's a PC. PC, that's better. Now, if I, if I push the button, mark slideshow. There we go. Okay. Now, this was the event. Uh, up to now, when we first started talking about Aurora back in January, I was the view that you look for big sunspots hmm. as the reason. Yep. And a bit later on, we found that a coronal hole. A sol creating a solar wind. Wind. Yeah, okay. Now, this one was caused by a magnetic filament. <laughs> Ooh, what's that when it's at home? Uh, now, unfortunately, w w I haven't got the video that's behind this image. Okay. Uh, but uh, it's on the web. Okay. Uh, and you can see some whitey yellow cover that sort of strings across it's to the right. Horizontal sort of line. -ish. Now, if 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 I still ha if I had the video, you would see these things sort of sparkling and blowing up and oh okay uh, right across right okay. and that's a magnetic filament <laughs> right so it's a sort of a linear yeah li line or something like that and, yeah. and the one of the big ones you can see is pointing almost straight at the earth oh okay and and that's what 
caused it. Now, so this is th these things are obviously ejecting energy. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, so we now have got three things to look for: <laughs> sunspots, coronal holes, and magnetic filaments. filaments. I love it. Uh, now the interesting thing about this is the. If we go to the next slide, I think. Oh. Uh, yeah. All right. Let's go that way. Yep. This is what the sunspots looked like, and there are some tiny little oh, spots in where, a line, in line okay. roughly where the magnetic filament is. Okay. But if you just looked for sunspots, you wouldn't be thinking... Well, you wouldn't think those, th those that, that ones. little line, because there's a big one above it. <laughs> That's right. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, there's, there's things that look like sunspots but tiny in the middle of a magnetic filament. But I think the difference is the magnetic filaments have a very short time scale. Oh, OK. And they, okay. they're they there all the time, but they're coming and going and yep. splattering and, okay. <laughs> and so forth. And you've got to get one that splatters just... In the right direction. In the right direction. Yeah, OK. OK. And so forecasting these, I suspect, is much more difficult. But... Uh, if we go to the There next seems to be an awful lot going on in the sun. That's right. Much more than I ever thought. That's my take home on this. Uh, yes. <laughs> now, uh, Noah gave a three-day forecast, and they said the the KP will peak at 4.6, which we've never really found 4.6 good enough. Okay, okay. And particularly if it was on the side when Australia was not on the dark side. Uh, uh, the ring. The ring. Yep. So I wasn't really expecting anything. Okay. Uh, but but we try <laughs> decided to try just in case. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's that it's that intrepid spirit of amateur radio. Yes. Next one. Ne next slide. Now this Ooh, is right. after the event. Okay. Uh, obviously the forecast of four point six was nowhere near correct because much higher than that. The top one is the American NOAA forecast. It's eight, isn't it? It's eight. <laughs> <laughs> and it was eight for <coughs> each of these uh, little segments. Yeah, yeah. three hours. Okay, okay. So you can see it was eight for a long time. <laughs> well, it was eight three, or seven. Six, nine for at least 12 hours. Yes. And then uh, it drop back to seven for yeah seven and then uh, another six hours and yes okay now the the Noah one I don't quite understand why it is so different to the Australian region one which is the lower one the lower one okay I mean ours only got up to six and. Uh, That's still three hours down the bottom. That's, yes, yeah, yeah. three. Okay. Yes, uh, actually, the Bureau of Meteor these this comes from the Bureau of Meteorology side. Okay, and they provide the NOAA forecast and their own forecast. Oh, excellent. Underneath, love it. it. So love you can it. just copy the whole thing. Uh, now they do say their forecast is for the Australian region. Okay, and that might be part of the explanation, but. If but, the, but hang on, if the NOAA one is that high and it's an average of many sites, yeah. there are lots of sites which were higher than that, potentially. Or well, there so was a lot of sites that were at that level to get to that level, yeah, if that's an average. Yeah, it's... Uh, hmm. Uh, hmm, interesting. However, so what you've got to... I mean, I think we've discussed this before. You, you've got to... Uh, be a bit careful about relying on the KP index uh, for forecasting. Well, actually, last time it was it started off at two, didn't it? And it, you, you were still getting signals at two. Well, which, something like that. Yes. Was, which, yeah, that seems a bit strange. So, but anyway, okay. Uh, now, we, we, uh, my understanding is the Americans is based on the average of thirteen sites and. I would have thought they were 13 all around the world. Okay. But maybe they focused on North America. Correct. And yes. And when they average them out... <laughs> they, 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 they obviously, but they obviously got a pretty good show. 
That's right. <laughs> yes, and we will see later that in fact, uh, the sort of middle area where they got a good show was the time that the it was sort of uh, magnetic midday. I'm going to call it. Okay. Okay. Uh, which is roughly midday anyway. Okay. Okay. Down here. Down when here. we get the weakest signals. Right. Uh, so they were very lucky that this. Pete, uh, the magnetic midnight, right, in the right, dark. right, right in the. Mm. Well, it's it, we're talking radio, so it's not a question of whether it's dark or not to see it. Yeah, okay. But it just turns out that radio needs aurora, and the way the auroras work is when the sun, when the sun is up. Yep. You would think that would be when you receive it. Yep. But the reality is the particles actually have to, f when the flow past the Earth, and, and then come back on the, on the dark side. <laughs> right. Uh, which is all the opposite of what you'd think. Yep. But <laughs> okay, okay. So... But, but we, all, we also... There are observation sites that, it, that enable you... That to, to do that prediction with the ring, so you actually know... Yeah, we will go on to the yeah, rings. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, next slide. Now, this is an example in Southern California, just near San Diego. They saw it. <laughs> now, wow. they had everything going for them. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah, were, yeah. yeah. The, uh, and, uh, Are there any, any amateurs in the States doing any... Not that I'm aware of, and and I've been talking to a f couple of my friends there, okay. Okay. who basically I don't think they want to do it, but they've been spreading the message. Okay. But I don't th about using digital modes for for Aurora. For Aurora. Well, I'm truly. But I don't think they've caught on to it yet. Ten miles from the Mexican border. Border. <laughs> Which so, means, what, what the hell was going on in, like, Alaska? Oh, they yeah. Would have, they would have had a just a phenomenal show, but anyway. Okay. So the reality is, this was a big event, and as we think the uh, KP index is a sort of a log scale, yep. uh, eight is... Off the show. And presumably nine is a Carrington event. <laughs> so, and this wasn't the sunspot. This was... Actually, that's a good point. Has anyone <laughs> done an estimation of what they think the Carrington event was in the in, in KP? KP? <laughs> uh, An interesting exercise. I'm not sure they had magnetometers. No, no. Well, <laughs> so, so. well they had magnetometers, uh, pseudo magnetometers on the ends of long track telegraph lines that yeah. went a bit berserk when things yeah. happened. But anyway, so um, I'm sure someone probably has a way of doing it, but mm -hmm. I haven't looked that up. Okay. So. We know now that this was a very big event. It's a huge event. Next slide. Now, uh, this is just a very small segment of the signals that uh, Brody BK seven AP was receiving. One of the, one of three AP MAP. Three. <laughs> yes, <laughs> three MAP. Uh, now, one of the problems we have is. Hams like to do QSOs, but if you want to understand what's going on, you've got to keep everything consistent. Yes. <laughs> and uh, okay. a couple of times, Brody went off and did QSOs <laughs> off the Aurora, and uh, my situation was a bit difficult because I was minding my grandson in the afternoon, and I left it running C calling CQ and people were trying to answer me and I found out that afterwards that <laughs> people were getting rather pissed off <laughs> but well no Brody let them know that oh, okay. grandchild mining was yeah. the okay. priority but a number of VK3s had contacts uh, now this is SSB contacts uh, SSB contacts yes wow okay. they, they gave reports like uh Eight and three and eight and things like this. <laughs> Readability three, signal strength eight. Okay. Yeah, no. Did any of them record it? Just a matter of interest. Not aware, but would have been an interesting recording. Yes. Now, 
this the the reason this is a small segment it is just a, the few decodes out of eleven hundred and fifty eight nearly as many as last time nearly as many as last time uh, the main problem we will look at in the next slide as to why we didn't get it and you'll notice at about 2400 which is UTC time which is about the, yeah. the about 1200 uh, 1000 Australian or yeah. uh, anyway yeah. around midday uh, we lost the signal altogether, and that's sort of to be expected. Yep. Okay. Uh, the the bars which are hard to see are magnetic midnight. Ah, uh, these. These. Yeah. And they should be the best time. So twenty seven and twenty seven, which is here. We unfortunately weren't around the. the I, I think. Magne the time of magnetic midnight for us, the the aurora wasn't. Okay. Wasn't present. Yeah. Okay. Now, you can see there is one large burst uh, about there, 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 and essentially the blue is the Doppler, and you can see it's all negative by about two hundred hertz on yep. average. Okay. And then after the uh, when we got to the uh, up to midday, yep, uh, it goes positive. It goes positive, and really dense. And really dense, and yeah. signal strength is the red. So yep. the signal okay. strength's really gone up, even as far as. So this is plus. This is zero and above. Yes. Okay. So there's some there about. 3 dB wow. on okay. the WSJT scale. Okay. So, in in simple terms, this is sort of what we've been expecting. That up to uh, after after magnetic midnight, you have negative. Yep. And before magnetic in, in midnight, you have positive. Not quite at the other end. You can see it went yeah, negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's interesting because that sort of tends to drop off and then looks as if it picks up again yeah. before magnetic midnight here. Now, I, I suspect the reason for this is we're talking about two cells, one rotating clockwise and one rotating counterclockwise, and it may be that it, because I've got a fairly broad beam width, I might be still on the the one and, and crossing over to the to, other one to the other one yeah, yeah, okay. and because perhaps the one rotation is not actually all that active it's you can see it's dropped off and yep. then I've got a burst from the other rotation yep. yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, th I think that might be a function of wide beam width that why that happened absolutely fascinating Yes. Now, if we look at the start, you'll notice there were just a few... Oh, oh, sorry. That was me. No, no. Go back the other way. Oh, too far. Right there. Just there's there's there. a few decodes there. Uh, there's both... The uh, signal strength is the bottom ones mainly, and the, the yeah, actual okay. Doppler is blue... So there's only about four or five decodes yep. at that time. Uh, but the odd thing is then we got a lot of decodes at 800 hertz, well, 800 hertz Doppler, which is actually a, a, a frequency, yep. which is actually a Doppler of 100 hertz. And this went on for about two hours. No, that's a bit weird. Uh, not very strong. And not very many of them. And, uh, that, and not very many of them. It's, 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 uh, all, all those red ones at the bottom are all the signal strengths, yep. and, and uh, the blue and ones the blue in there. is the is the Doppler. At now, hertz. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I've been looking into what this could be. I mean, you 
you, you can imagine that you would get occasionally some direct signals, you know, and but they would be on on zero Doppler. Yeah. Uh, even if they're off an aircraft at two meters, you never get more than one or two hertz of Doppler shift. Yep. Okay. So. It's sort of, and an aircraft wouldn't hang around. Well, it might be two aircraft, but it wouldn't hang around for an hour. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, and it, it, there is like, there's quite an appreciable line there. Yeah. At, at 100 hertz, plus 100 hertz. That's right. Uh, now, we'll go forward. Now, this is where we we need to do some tricky tricky stuff here, because we will go to. Um, Come back to here because I've got to play. So yeah, we're going to play one of the eight hundred hertz files, and and you can actually hear the tones, and they're not spread. So they're, they're weak, oh, but. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Believe me, I'm getting there. Um, play. You can just hear the tones. Yeah. But, but the, the tones themselves don't seem to be spread. No, because you can hear the tones. They're, yes. You can hear them yeah, as tones. Uh, yes. Okay. S uh, and we'll now go on to some auroral signals. Yeah, I think that was that one, wasn't it? We'll, we'll find out when it okay. comes. <laughs> oh, well. Now, this, this is an auroral signal that decodes... Can't do anything. But it's... It, Decades about minus fourteen, so it's a very weak auroral signal. So you wouldn't expect so, to hear the tones. And and when you look at it on the waterfall, there's nothing. It's yeah. spread okay. all over the place, and you don't see anything. Okay. And the next one. The next is a this is a strong auroral signal. So that's the tones being spread. Yes. And that was the one I heard when I walked in. Yeah, about yeah. that time. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so clearly, there is a big difference between these eight hundred hertz ones or one hundred hertz Doppler ones. Yep. So we'll now go on to have a look at what I did. Is I broke up all of the uh, uh, periods where I got decodes in three hour increments okay uh, which I can compare with the royal oval which we will do okay okay a bit later and uh, uh, you can see there we we started off with no decodes then just two then it crept up to 55 nine, nine yeah but I'm a bit worried about the 59 because the 800 hertz are in there okay. and I'm not completely sure they're anything to do with the aurora. Yeah, okay. But I can't imagine what else they're to do with. <laughs> um, then it came up to 99, 263. And 263 is a lot because in a three-hour period, there are 360 transmissions. So, yeah, okay. So, so you're only 100 short of the maximum. Absolutely, and bearing yeah. in mind how this, these signals are also jumbled up with <laughs> auroral spreading, uh, it's, it's... It's definitely got statistical significance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then it came up down to zero in yep. a three-hour period, and this is the time about when... Uh, the midday. The, the midday yeah. effect. Okay. Uh, and so we lost it, and then not too much after did, midday, this thing was right back again. Okay. Even more decodes. Yes, um, 266, 230. Yep, uh, and, and tapers off. And yeah. tapers off. So I think the event itself went over this full period, yep. but 
we had a hole in the middle because of the midday effect. Okay. Okay. Uh, but either side of that was um, phenomenal. Strong. Okay. Okay. Now, when we look at the 800 hertz anomaly, what I've done here is on the waterfall and on the uh, WSJT spectrum display, uh, had a look at the 800 hertz signal, and they're certainly not spread. Uh, they, 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 there's one right out to the right, mm. which is a birdie, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, okay. So I, I wouldn't worry too much. Yep. And a couple of these other spikes are probably just uh, this, the actual tones. Yep. But the, the actual sync tone, which is, is right on 800 hertz, uh, and there are three examples. They're the strongest examples of it, so that it would show up. Okay. Uh, and there's no evidence that the sync tone is being spread. So... Dead straight. So what was the signal coming from that was producing... 100 hertz of Doppler for several hours. <laughs> it was a UFO, Rick. A UFO, yeah. And next. Now, this is some 800 hertz tones that were at other times when they were clearly spread. Oh, yeah. Well, and, the and there's no evidence. You can sort of see around 800 hertz, there's... You can imagine a line. Yes. Uh, but it's spread by yeah. a couple of hundred hertz. Uh, so, oh, yeah, okay. this is clearly an auroral <laughs> 800 hertz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other is it's something else. A mystery 800 hertz. Okay. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Now, this is the auroral oval, which is the way NOAA forecasts their 30 minute gives their 30 minutes forecast. Okay. Uh, I think they got a satellite out there that's measuring it, but then they model it from the data they get. Okay. And when it was looking like this, it's a fair distance from Tasmania and even further from Brody, who's in Victoria. Yep. And we got nothing. Nil decodes. Okay. Okay. Now we can go to the next slide. Ooh. It's getting closer and more intense. And see more a bit of yellow. Bit of yellow. And we have got two decodes, but no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Now we get 59 codes. Uh, is a question mark about whether the, these are the uh, some of these are the 800 hertz ones. So oh, okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Next slide. Now we get 99 decodes and not much difference. And these are certainly auroral ones. Yep. And you've got no yellow. Yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. no yellow. Next slide. Now it goes. <laughs> And we get 263 decodes. And really intense, like really this is top of the scale. Yes, but... But only with the tail end of it. That's right. Unfortunately, the daylight... This thing has a shade at the bottom. Oh, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which shows the area of the Earth that's in daylight. So it's showing the grey line on the, the, on, yes. the on the globe. Yeah. Uh, and then, the next, then it okay. gets right into this area where... Yep. And you we're, can see why. We're in the middle of the day and we get nothing. Okay. Next. And then only three hours later, it's it's a long way from Brody, but 266 decodes. Is it actually bouncing off the other side of the, like, going... Oh, I don't think so. No. Okay. Next. Next. <sighs> And now 230, which is a bit less. Yeah, but much closer. But much closer. And much more intense. Next slide. Down to 184. And it's much closer. And you'd think you'd get more. Well, truly. Now, one of the things is when it gets like that, eventually I'm only beaming at the horizon and the aurora is at up at 100 kilometres. Yeah, okay. And maybe I should be beaming up. up to it, and maybe that's reducing the, the signal. Oh, wow. This is an, an experimental parameter for you. Yes, that's too many. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, it's now down to 51 decodes, and yet 
it doesn't seem a lot different. That you'd expect that to be a whole lot better, wouldn't you? Yes. It's close. It's intense in the middle. It's anyway. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. And it's now down to nil, and it's not a long way away. But the intensity's dropped off, and then get next. It's it's interesting, you know. This is that that change in intensity is quite dramatic. Yes. Like, because this, this is every three hours. That's, yeah. And for, it's gone from, like, top of the scale, pro and all the way to almost nothing. And then I suppose that's a probability of an aurora actually seeing an aurora. Hmm, okay. Next slide. And then it's essentially... So what's going on here is there is the intensity of the aurora combined with the day-to-night effect. And the proximity? And the proximity, yes. Yeah. Well, there you go. Okay. Uh, now, what I've done is I've actually... Oh, you've made your own. No, I didn't well, make it. it I, I, I turned the Bureau of Meteorology's forecast as oh. being more appropriate to our yep. region. region on its side so I could type on it. Uh, okay, okay. And <laughs> all this shows certainly... The, the, it correlates. It correlates, roughly. Uh, but it obviously doesn't take any account of the day-night effect. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, see, that's a three-hour block, so there's a continuous change from one end of that block to the other. Yes. And potentially that, you know, that 263 could have been anywhere, almost anywhere in that block. Yes. Well, it's actually... It's in the middle of two blocks, and it's a, a half an hour either side. Yeah, okay. uh, one and a half hours either okay. side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that is where we've got to at the moment. Um, okay. And. Uh, wow. We will do more tests. When and and get... I, I assume Mr. Mr. Klukachuk is beavering away on. He, he, he did produce a nice paper on this. Okay. Uh, and I was going to get him to come along tonight, but oh. unfortunately he had a... Had to another another thing to do. Yes. Uh, so, well, he's, he's had another thing to do during the day, which means he, he couldn't come. Uh, but perhaps after the next time we get an aurora, we'll get him involved in... He Tell is. us about the science behind all this. I love it. Now we we do have uh, we've got Sean up in New Norfolk and Andrew down at Signet, uh, David at Blackman's Bay, uh, Ben across the river, and Lee, who's a apology tonight, and I hope you're feeling slightly better, Lee, um, and David Bannister, um, listening from Howrah, um, uh, BZ. Now what's the BZ? You need to. Is that a is that another Aurora? Measurement was nine minus thirty three in the late afternoon, which is incredible. I typically don't see it go below minus eight. So explain what BZ is, Ben, if you're still watching. Um, Lee's at Gilson Bay. Uh, Harry's also watching tonight. Um, and <laughs> see, Lee Lee said aliens as well. Um, and Lee's surviving. Excellent. Good work. Good work. Okay. Um, now I, I, I have been, uh, and by all means, um, please Ben, let us know what B Z is. Um, I think B is a magnetic term. Okay. And Z probably is the Z dimension of it. <laughs> okay. Well, well, we'll hopefully find out if Ben's still watching. Um, now we've been doing. Uh, we have uh, our centenary. Uh, in June, the WIA centenary in, in VK7. And um, we've been doing some work around articles for AR magazine. Uh, and one of them was Len Crooks, who is, who is uh, Silent Key, uh, VK7 BZ, uh, B, 
Q. Yes. Big Q. Um, uh, we had some historical material from Len. And so I was looking through a whole bunch of his old QSL cards, and there was some photos in there as well that we were, we are putting in the articles. But um, there were two particular QSL cards that jumped out at me when I saw them. And Rex can explain the significance of them. Right. <laughs> Do you want to... We can we can put them on the uh, on the big um, the big screen here the close up camera. Which one do you want to go with first? Oh, the, or or uh, we can have perhaps both. that one. That one. Okay. And we'll zoom in here a little bit. Now. Okay. You'll notice the name up the top is Len Moncur, mm -hmm. which was is my father. VK three LN. And this QSL card is from 1949, and I would have been seven years old at the time. Uh, and you notice he st stamped on the QSL card, Operating Portable Keeler. Now, I do remember going out on field days to Keeler with my dad. In those days, Keeler was... In the sticks. Farmland, <laughs> sheep country. <laughs> Nowadays it's all houses and <laughs> a part of Melbourne. Uh, and uh, he, f he threw antennas up in trees and, okay. and worked okay. the field days with a, a, a Type 3, uh, Type 3 Mark II radio, which was, I think, one of the Coast Watchers sort of oh, okay. radios. Oh, okay. Okay, yes. Uh, and produced, uh, I don't know, about five watts or something like that. And, there you go. And a receiver and stuff. And uh, I uh, uh, think, uh, well, it, it sort of brings back to me <laughs> the memories of going out with my dad on field days as a seven-year-old. I love uh, it. I love it. Uh, or about that age. So now I, I have to say the, um, the 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 four element motor driven beams on fourteen and twenty eight, seventy three feet high. Yes, uh, we had. My dad built this mast on the roof or tower on the roof of our See, I think house. You've shown a picture of that. I people, have. I think yes. yes. And a very uh, impressive wooden. He, he he originally made it out of wood, okay. but it collapsed, and Whoops. we we lived in a very old house which had a uh, slate roof, and all these slates got um, broken. Broken, <laughs> and my dad focused more on radio than he should have, and. He did sort of stuff the slates around and try and stop the leaks, but the reality is my poor mum, every time it rained, used to go around the house putting buckets <laughs> to stop the drips. Uh, <laughs> later, he decided, when, he re, when he tried to replace this, he actually play, replaced it with a, a angle iron governor, no, an angle iron tower which he painted uh, the reason he painted it is because whoever quoted him the cost of galvanising, it wasn't a big increase in costs, but... Uh, it was enough. It was enough <laughs> that he went with galvanised, uh, with uh, ungalvanised, and right. meant he had to paint this thing for years and years. And it's, it, so it was up there from the, the 1940s and... I guess it uh, wasn't pulled down till Dad died in about 1996. So, <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, and on a very small block behind a shop, to run something, a four-element, twenty-meter full-size beam on twenty meters on twenty meters was a fair effort. Yeah. Okay. Now the other QSL card unfortunately doesn't have a date, but. I'm sure this is a much earlier one. For a few reasons. Yes. It says that the postcode was W2, 
which must have been western part of Melbourne zone two zone or two <laughs> yeah. uh, oh and, and the time was given as Melbourne time. <laughs> Mel Melbourne <laughs> Melbourne tea. Yes. And and also we we you just, the QSA. Yes. Q, uh, uh, Not quite sure. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I have noticed that on some of the earlier QSL cards. So yeah. so yeah. I should have Th bought the... Thanks for QSO and your signal sounded the, as though the coil was unwinding or something. <laughs> was... Yeah, it might be unwinding. So it sounds sounds was... like it might have been a rural <laughs> type of... <laughs> a, a strong signal, put it that way. Uh, well... Perhaps it wasn't crystal locked in the early 1930s and the, the, the signal depended on... <laughs> Correct. Correct. ...an RC time constant. Now, a little bit over the neck, it, there's the word T-O-O-B... Tube. T-2. Two, two tube. <laughs> with, with wide or, audio. <laughs> with audio. <laughs> two tube. Yeah. In the receiver... Now this this has to be very early because I've certainly seen some of his early receivers that were super heads. Okay. Okay. And had a lot more valves than two. Yep. Uh, and did you know about the 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 sixty six foot? No. Forty foot high ante and uh, doublet yeah. antenna. No, I didn't. So it was all before my time. I I dad was licensed in nineteen thirty. Okay. So. I suspect this is a very early... Uh, the other reason I suspect this is it says your CW, I think, yep. and Dad was never keen on CW, so he fairly soon got on to AM. So okay. I suspect that... The, the other thing, Rex, is owner-operator. Yes, owner-operator, whatever that means. <laughs> And in fact, the transmitter. So it's transmitter on this side, and it's receiver on this side, and it's still circuit, tube, and input. And I assume that's 25. That looks like 25 to me. It does look like 25 watts DC. That's a fair bit of power in those days, isn't it? <laughs> circuit is something. Tube is something else. <laughs> um, Yes, his writing is no better than mine, actually. <laughs> and it's interesting because there is a transmit antenna and a receive antenna. There's two separate when the transmitter and the receivers were separate. Uh, I, I wouldn't be sure that the, there's a printed one on the card and then he's... And then yeah. he's filled it in over here the yeah, same. Yeah, half wave, I guess. Some Absolutely bit. fascinating. So, uh, Justin found these and I was very pleased to have them. <laughs> I went. Well, and, and for those who don't know, um, the person who sent these, um, Len Crooks, uh, Crook, was VK7BQ. He was, um, he was actually first licensed in 1925 um, and went on uh, in 1973 when we had our 75th anniversary. Um, Len was... Len, my understanding was he was still alive. Um, somebody may be able to correct me on that, but um, uh, he was still alive, and he was actually the patron of the Wireless Institute uh, back in 1973. Um, the patron was originally was Pop Medhurst, um, and you'll hear a lot of, lot more about Pop Medhurst because that's one of the articles we're actually writing right at the moment. Um, and it was at Len Crooks. Now, he lived in Launceston, uh, and there is a wonderful picture that we're including in the article, in the historic article that Richard Rogers wrote, um, of Len sitting in his shack uh, with his Edistone 640 or one of those 840 or one of those wonderful Edistone receivers, pride of place in the middle of the shack. <laughs> and he's sitting there reclining um, with... A, it, it's sort of floor-to-ceiling equipment... <laughs> for you know x meters so uh so it was it was pretty impressive shack um and that was 
in 1969 that picture was taken so uh, so yeah up in his uh, shack in Launceston so absolutely fascinating so I thought Rex really 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 needs to probably have these because they will mean something to Rex so. thank you <laughs> so now stick around Rex because the next thing is and and um, we've just had um, Lee's come back with the BZ relates to the solar winds magnetic orientation negative BZ is a better chance of aurora so negative 33 is a whole lot better than minus 8 negative 8 so there you go and Andrew Elwell just in the agenda for your information I'm currently up a ladder trying to refocus my all sky camera so the next great segue um, with the wonderful uh, keograms and pictures that were included um, that Andrew Klekachuk actually uh, supplied to Rex um, it sparked me into action <laughs> because a very very long time ago and can you grab that box as well the little box that's there now um, um, a, a long time ago and I'm, I'm talking pre-COVID I went to my favourite shop. Now, those people who know me know my favourite shop is the South Hobart Resource Tip Shop. <laughs> and they happen to have this this device. Um, it's, it's obviously been... Uh, it's got a pole mount. Um, it is beautifully made. It is all sealed. It is built for weather. There's a little observation window in here that had a little um, uh, electromechanical counter that looked out through the window. And it had in the in the the top, um, the, it had a very beaten around um, uh, perspex dome uh, that I've replaced. Um, but it had this was a an array of little solar cells, little individual solar cells that were all paralleled up and sierised up. And I. And it had a mercury battery inside, uh, as well as a rechargeable battery um, and a few little circuits and bits and pieces, all beautifully made, all obviously a bespoke installation for something. I don't know what it was. Um, it, it could be number of so, uh, like daylight hours or something like that, solar hours, and it counted, or it could have been something else. Um, but. There were solar cells in here and there was a counter that you could see through this little window here. The, the thing about it was I looked at it and I went, ah, that's exactly what I've been looking for, for a sky camera. So I pulled my finger out and did some milling <laughs> and did some modifications and bits and pieces. I took all of the electronics out of here um, and you can see um, there is now in here uh, a Raspberry Pi 4, there is a power over Ethernet hat on the Raspberry Pi 4 so that I can just feed it with, um, this is, I've got this in shielded uh, Ethernet cable and it goes to a, a, an Ethernet connector which is in the bottom of there. So it, it's all, you can pseudo weatherproof because that goes down the pole um, and then comes out the pole somewhere. Now. This is what I mean about it being beautifully made. There, there is everything. All of this has <laughs> all been made. There were, these were connectors. That was the counter uh, that fitted in there. Um, the desiccant is in a little test glass test tube with a bit of foam in the end, and it's full of desiccant. <laughs> so it, it, any moisture that does get in in um, uh, actually is then absorbed by the desiccant. And you can the thing about that is you can dry that out. You can put that in the oven, dry it out, put it back in again. Everything has uh, seals around it. There is a big silicon rubber seal that goes around here. Um, and there are even, the two bolts that hold it underneath, there are even little O-rings around each of those um, that go in into the bottom and then they get, they get screwed up. Um, and then the O-ring in here seals around here and there's, I, I, I'm putting silicon grease all the way around there. Um, so, um, that's the, the All Sky camera. I have actually got it working. Um, I, I, I wasn't going to show it tonight. Uh, and there is a 160, um, there's only a 5 megapixel camera in here. This is one of the standard 
Raspberry Pi cameras with a 160 degree lens on it. Um, so uh, that's that's. However, in this little box, I, I have just got a 12 megapixel camera <laughs> for a Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to increase the um, uh, the resolution. Um, so that's that's the arrangement. It's all fed by um, uh, and there's a little. Um, this is a little um, a little positioning arrangement so that it, it positions it for the. This is what I mean about it being bespoke. Um, it positions it so that those two screws on the bottom screw up <laughs> into it. So anyway, that's the um, that's the All Sky camera. Um, I've just got to find a pole to put it on and a few other things. So, um, and for those people who haven't seen the Raspberry Pi high resolution camera, um, this is. Oh, I did open it the right way. Um, this is the uh, this is the Raspberry Pi. Um, this is a whole lot bigger than this one. Um, and if I take the if I take the cover off just quickly oh, and turn the light on, turn the light on. Oh yeah, you can just see the. If I zoom in, you can just see the much much bigger CCD than array than than the uh, the traditional one, and and that's a that's a standard screw thread for a CCD type. Um, a CCTV type lens, so that's a standard uh, fitting for a lens. It's a standard um, Raspberry Pi connection. Uh, there is a mounting, a mounting, a quarter inch mounting hole on here, so you can actually put it on a tripod or something along those lines, or some sort of mounting. So that's the um, uh, that's the Raspberry Pi uh, High Q camera. Um, High quality camera. It's 12 megapixels, so it d does get me a little bit, a little bit more than the five megapixel that's on there. Um, but anyway, that's that'll end up going in there uh, with a with a suitable uh, fisheye lens. So, so yeah, um, that's the so it it, it or Andrew's um, <laughs> Andrew's inspiration was to pull my finger out. There was some machining that was required uh, for the hole for the, the ribbon cable and a few other things which I milled in. Um, and there was a few modifications that I had to do to the the, the, the mounting for the Raspberry Pi. Um, I have had it running for uh, the last... Uh, where, did you, where did you find this? The, 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 this? Yeah. This is standard um, CCTV um, equipment um, suppliers okay. they sell these in in a whole lot of different sizes and this this one I'm a bit worried about because the original one came right out to the edge here so you get water so in. I'm I'm gonna have to fill that yeah with with silicon to stop the water going down in there there's a big um, you can see you might not be able to see there's a big uh, silicon rubber ring orange silicon rubber ring that goes around there that that everything presses onto to seal seal everything down but um, yeah anyway that's that's the all sky camera <laughs> and I can I just say the all sky there is a, a wonderful and 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 Andrew um, ah I, I think there was one like that at Mount Pleasant well there you go so it may have come from Mount Pleasant. It had no identifying features on it, like UTAS or AAD or whatever. <laughs> um, and and but I just looked at it. And I went, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Um, I'm using the Thomas ja Jaquin um, GitHub um, release. I don't know, Andrew. You might want to let me know what what you're using if you're prepared to. Um, it's called All Sky. If you go to Git and put in All Sky, um, the, um, uh, the 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 distribution uh, and All Sky provides a little uh, web, uh, either a website uh, on the actual Pi or it can be on another machine that it transfers the files to. It automatically does can do a time lapse. It automatically can do the keogram. Um, and it, it it you can set it up so that it's capturing at whatever whatever regular 
um, uh, periodicity you want for the day and or the night or only come on at night and all of this sort of stuff. It's fantastic. And the, the little website enables you to do some configuration of it and, and all sorts of stuff. So, um, so, so yeah, it was the Thomas... I'll get this right. Thomas Jackwin. Uh, All Sky GitHub project is um, what I've been playing with. A uh, pretty impressive little piece of software, I have to say. Um, pretty reasonably easy to set up. Um, but uh, anyway, it, it does... I, and So at a future um, ATV event, I'll, what I'll do is show you what it outputs and, and show you the little website and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, anyway, that's all sky camera, um, and I finally got around to doing the the changes and everything that I needed to fit everything in and all of that sort of stuff. So anyway, that's that's the all sky. And so I I was I took inspiration from Mr. Andrew Ch Klekachuk <laughs> and his wonderful arrangement, <laughs> where he puts a whole lot of other information with it. But but yeah, this will this will just be a um, a uh, uh, an all sky camera. <laughs> And um, you can also, uh, there is an All Sky um, network uh, and you can contribute your website to the network so that people can actually then see it. Uh, and there's a whole bucket load of All Sky sites all over the world. So, um, so yeah. It's just, Amazing. <laughs> it's just, just phenomenal. But um, anyway. And, and yes, uh, it's a, uh, a Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, I probably shouldn't have said that. I probably should have said it was a Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, because now the uh, the white cylinder on top of my roof at uh, in South Hobart's probably now being targeted, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, given ras the given the price of raspberry pies, um, so so that's that's the uh, that's the situation. All sky camera, um, and just I, I I can't believe the the lengths that people go to and make it freely available, and it's all open source and. That's the wonderful community that um, that shares that sort of stuff. So, uh, so there you go. Now, um, I just wanted to. I'll finish off with some reminders. Um, we have had a few changes, and one of the changes is this is a DATV night. This was actually going to be a presentation by um, uh, by Hayden VK Seven HH on the repeater um, uh, re repeater situation. Um, We've moved that to next week because unfortunately our presenter for the FIO Marine uh, has come down fairly fairly seriously sick, uh, won't be here next week. Uh, so we've moved the repeater VK7RHT simulcasting voting presentation to next week. Um, now uh, Hayden will be presenting that via Zoom <laughs> because he's actually in isolation before he heads to America to Dayton. So, um, so, uh, but that means come along to the the the, um, the club rooms. We'll have it on the big screen. Uh, you'll be able to ask questions of, of Hayden via Zoom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, anyway, that's uh, that's the story. Um, and we'll we'll postpone the the Fio Marine one until a a later date once uh, Brendan's uh, better again. So, uh, so yeah, that's our show for tonight. And this has been uh, VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association Southern Tasmania with our DATV Experimenters Nights. And it's good night from me. Good night. Cool. <laughs> 73. Have a, uh, have a good week. Um, oh, good. Thank you, Justin.